what I'm keen to cover here is a bit of a mixture of things, um, a little bit about what the project actually is and um, how we've managed to get it to where it is. And I'm going to um, be very cynical and pick your brain for uh, help steer it as it goes forward and um, try and see if I can explain a little bit about where, but how we see this continuing to be sustainable and some of the, um, the tricks that we've used so far. So <clears throat> um, first of all, I'm going to highlight there's obviously there's the uh, Google Doc and um, linked there as well um, is the talk slide so you can have a look at your leisure because I'm going to go through these reasonably quickly um, just to keep everything's time. A um, bit of context on who I am. Uh, so I'm um, an applied mathematician by background and I've done mostly finite element modeling um, in academic context, both from um, a university research and industrial research. Um, and then decided that I was um, a bit tired of dealing with proprietary code, so started a company to do uh, open source. And, does it, and we do a mixture of uh, product services, consultancy and training. Um, and uh, that's, a lot of that work is in collaboration with a number of other companies. Um, and if anyone's interested in how we've done that, I can talk a little bit about that at the end as well. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Boston, there's uh, a talk of that around um, how we actually managed to uh, not all fall out. So, um, our region planet, um, this slide's mostly here because I like a volcano with lines on it. Um, it was started as a project to try and help uh, young people, um, particularly GCSE students, engage with human geography aspects of natural disasters. So, for example, understanding what it really means when, uh, you know, there's an earthquake in Christchurch. And actually this came about because uh, I was in, I did my PhD in New Zealand and was there at the time. And uh, for those of you who haven't guessed by the accent, I'm actually in Belfast at the minute. Um, around the Christchurch area, there's a whole load of Belfast themed place names. And I was starting to see all of these place names coming up around the time of the earthquake and had friends there at the time. And suddenly realized that it actually brings it home quite literally and metaphorically in a different way. So the idea was to try and give those students a context by saying, let's say, let's imagine a volcano is happening in Belfast. Now plan around that, think through how that works. And to do that, we've got an aspect interface, and I'll show a brief uh, video demo in a second. <clears throat> so what does that actually mean outside of education context? Because this is much more broad. Um, sector agnostic, open source, on demand, container based, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, um, trying to provide a platform that makes it straightforward to go from a bit of, say, Python code to something that you can actually use with um, real people. And whether that's primarily that's focused around geospatial applications, but the principle extends. And I'll mention that too. So why? Well, here's, this is a little bit of an old uh, example. I've got a more recent one uh, a bit further on. Um, uh, what you can see here is uh, Newcastle, and um, that's Newcastle, Northern Ireland, um, and uh, it's a using some of the Copernicus data um, to work out um, as uh, as sea level would rise um, rapidly. Say, for example, in a um, Hurricane Katrina type uh, storm surge, a very rough simulation of this. Um, how over time things would happen and then put around some questions and kind of fake social media um, alerts and that's part of the educational context. So one stage I was sitting down trying to do product research with Google Santa Tracker so that will give you an idea of where this, this came from um, originally. But uh, the idea from the outset was that this wasn't going to, that this interface while it's primarily targeted education, the actual infrastructure uh, is much more general. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we've done that core build. Uh, we did a group test with students, and this was um, hugely educational. 
because what we found was that we had done a fairly basic approach where you can create a simulation and do a simulation and it wasn't there wasn't a huge amount of focus on the scalability of the simulations themselves so if you know 50 people want to run them things will slow down and what we found was that students were kind of bored because clicking back and forth through a timeline is only so exciting but one of them said to me can i see the admin side and i went well you know why not um, so suddenly they were able to put a flood on top of their school and then it became 10 times more interesting and then the other uh, 10 uh, kids all wanted to put a flood on top of their school and um, we ended up doing 10 simulations of the same thing in the same location but it was 10 times more interesting for each of them because they all got to interact with it so we started redeveloping that um, and actually that made it much more relevant outside of um, outside of education so uh, that's currently what we're doing. We're currently doing a, a small fund project at the moment to try and uh, get some of that fleshed out, improving user management particularly. Um, redesigning our admin side is ongoing at the moment. Um, and we're currently working on an SDK for getting from, say, a basic Python script into the cloud. And I'll talk a bit about the technical um, structure at the end, but I want to make sure I <clears throat> get through the rest first. And also, uh, what we're trying to do is some workshops um, a bit like this to try and get some feedback um, on where people would actually find it most useful. Uh, so I mentioned I did some uh, surgical simulation work with uh, Horizon 2020 projects in the past and one of my big takeaways from that was uh, we were looking at the infrastructure and Docker side of it <clears throat> and um, that being able to wrap up a simulation um, or computer model in a way that could be that was abstracted from the interface and from the modeling, the um, domain modeling, made it uh, much more flexible to expand and do different models and exchange things and compare and contrast and so forth. So that's where we're working. So what I want to cover are um, how we did this. Um, so some of the tech I'll do a little bit now and I'll come back at the end. Um, how we are currently doing this and keeping keeping basically the lights on and development going and um, how we're going forward. So first thing I mentioned, and this comes both into the tech side and into the <clears throat> um, and into the uh, Uh, sorry, just had a complete mind back there. Yes, so this is both the tech side and also the uh, open and sustainability um, side, how we actually keep it all running. And that's been making sure that we're not tying ourselves to well, the application. <clears throat> now to do that, that um, simulation work, uh, we did, um, and this was some years back, I uh, was involved in a project called GoSmart, and we were uh, looking at um, cancer treatment, and in particular, uh, creating a web platform where new simulations could be added and, <clears throat> and dynamically, and then run by, for example, uh, researchers with clinicians uh, to test out concepts. And uh, we had to look at defining a a domain model in a um, computing context to abstract that sufficiently that we were able to make this really quite general um, and then be able to define some, S some SDK tools that could be put together to <clears throat> allow someone to create a simulation and, and effectively post it in. And there's a lot of learning went on on that, uh, particularly that was uh, early days of, of some of the Docker stuff. And one of the big things that we um, we managed to whittle down was how we would split up um, the different entities um, into uh, tiers um, that were somewhat internally consistent. So, for example, where our data, uh, how our data interrelated, how things about a case context. So, a case context could be a patient, um, or it could be in the our plant context. A 
um, an area around the time. Simulation, and then we're looking at uh, different actual applications of simulations to that. So for example, this in the cancer treatment context could be radio frequency ablation with a probe applied to a specific um, clinical case. Uh, and then an abstract here where we step back and say, okay, well, radio frequency ablation, what is that? Once we take out a specific patient, what is the actual numerical model? How do we store the code for that? How do we manage that? Um, so, oh yeah, okay. So as a summary of how that fits together, <clears throat> we uh, start with an admin panel. Um, at that point, a model can be added. And that's something we're uh, working on in different ways than the already planet one. Uh, we also have data that comes in, generally open data, and a big part of what we do is working with local government data, especially in this geospatial context, and that is able to appear on the front end. Back end then effectively links those together, so we can have, <clears throat> um, we can define new simulations over that data that can appear in the front end through an admin panel, um, and then that can be sent off to a computation server which runs the analysis in uh, Docker. Just out of curiosity, um, I think I can see, are people familiar with Docker or have people come across it? Got one or two nods. Okay, so Docker is a little bit like a, a very light uh, virtual machine. So in the past, it's had a number of weaknesses, some of which have been addressed, some of which are still being addressed. But one of its uh, great benefits is that um, you can run something on your machine and run it in the cloud or private cloud or bare, uh, bare metal in a lot of different ways, um, but have a very consistent environment. So it's good for moving code back and forward um, in a consistent way. Um, now this just goes back to our back end and then it can be presented to the user, laid over whatever that town is with all its open data. Okay. So that's a little bit of an introduction to the <coughs> tech background. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an icebreaker, um, which is partially to try and understand how um, how people see open source, for example, and open data, um, but also where they see it being relevant. So I was originally going to do this, uh, let me see, we'll maybe give that a few minutes. Uh, since there's just five of us, um, shall we maybe uh, just do it verbally here? Um, does anyone want to, to start off with something that um, they wish was open source or and why? May, actually, I'll maybe give a, an example to kick off because this is actually one of the reasons I started my company. Was I was doing engineering um, and working with uh, bridge software and we were comparing to some GPU accelerated software we were writing. Um, and we realized that we couldn't actually access um, even what the model was that was being used for the bridge simulations um, because it was essentially, essentially it was uh, commercially sensitive. Um, so there was no real way of us knowing what the model was, whether it was valid, what range it was valid for. We effectively had to take the company on trust. Um, and when there's excellent software in that arena where you do have that information, I was surprised that that was um, that was the norm for for critical structures. So that that would be my example. Does anyone else have one they'd like to suggest? Yes. Um, so along those lines, actually, um, I have a similar issue with. Uh, automated ECG electrocardiogram interpretation, um, which happens within uh, on ECG machines, within hospitals and so on. They're all closed source. And I have a, a similar but related issue. So we're working on sort of automated interpretation techniques. Um, and it's really difficult to benchmark them. And what you want to be able to do is, 
is say, okay, this compares to the kind of industry standard in this way, but without actually knowing what they're doing with the data and the algorithms. And it's really, really difficult to actually say anything sensible about that. And it really hampers research, I think, not being able to have access to what's actually going on. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that, that benchmarking example, I think that's a great one because it, it comes up in so many different areas, especially with things where, you know, people's lives are depending on it being right. It, you know, it's very hard to do a third party analysis. Has anyone else got examples along those lines? of the obvious ones that come to my mind are proprietary data formats rather than software <laughs> yeah uh, in particular the various arc esri uh <laughs> geospatial <laughs> formats <laughs> they're great <laughs> oh yes special place in my heart <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually i have to admit, I, I, I do know some of the esri folks and they are they are really good i, I do like them but yeah that's um yeah and we all kind of know how to crack them open, but <laughs> yeah. But then you're you're kind of back to the Microsoft Word challenges of the 2000s, where the next thing you know, the format shifted, and suddenly, mm. and you know, it's it's always the interpreter's fault. It's always the interpreter's problem, as opposed to the actual um, data producer in that context. Yeah. Um, I think actually that that data one as well. There, uh, we've been looking at. Uh, we're currently doing a project with one of our clients around um, bridge sensors, and it's been fascinating to see how, again, particularly in the engineering sector, I think more so than most, there some of the. the Key players can be quite aggressive in using uh, using data formats to make sure that you stay within an ecosystem. Um, and it is it's you know that there's an argument that um, it's quite a different environment, to say apps or general software or so forth. But in some ways, even more so, it um, it means you're starting to make decisions about what you're putting into infrastructure, into civil infrastructure, based on. What, based on being locked in. And it was a fantastic example I heard a couple of years ago about um, a hospital that had an MRI machine um, and it plugged into a computer that was basically managed by a computer that ran XP. Um, and when XP reached end of life, it turned out that the company that had made the drivers had gone bust, but there was no way of anyone taking and using that, even commercially taking and using that code. Um, so the entire MRI machine had to be scrapped. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, you can see quite practical implications. And of course, now with, with COVID, I, there's been a, a number of um, open uh, organizations trying to collaborate on this. In fact, the number of things is quite huge. But yeah, definitely uh, um, good to see that there's movement forward in that area. Open source ventilators.ie is an interesting one if people haven't come across it. Um, okay. Well, hopefully that, that gives a, a little bit of an idea. Uh, oh, there's a link to the session talk. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons. And, <clears throat> you know, as I say, coming from that surgical simulation background, particularly, I can see why it's uh, critical to have that transparency. And in a way, having uh, being able to modularize some of the logic uh, is helpful in that um, it means that what you're able to share as uh, you know core algorithm becomes a lot more succinct and um, readable. Okay, so uh, how do we kick this off? This is kind of moving on to the sustainability aspect. Um, we were fortunate to uh, get some support from Open Data NI, um, who were interested in uh, ways of actually making open data in uh, Northern Ireland benefit, um, benefit Northern Ireland. Uh, so uh, they uh, funded a couple of education uh, projects. Um, so we um, 
got involved with that. Um, um, they've been fantastically supportive um, ever since. And uh, especially, I think one thing to highlight, and I imagine this is true for quite a lot of uh, open data organisations. I don't know if anybody um, have much contact with uh, things like Open Data Camp or Open Data organisations in general. I highly recommend Open Data Camp. Um, I go every year; it's great fun. Uh, but it's a um, derived from um, GovCamp. Um, so there's an interesting mix of uh, academic, public sector, private sector, um, and it's a non-conference, so it can be quite creative. But there's there's quite a it's an area of um, where there's quite a lot of public sector involvement from people in the public sector who tend to be very open to and in, engaged with new ideas. Um, okay. So I think we've kind of covered, so why open source and open data? I think there's the sustainability perspective for us. Um, I've always had a passion for open source, but starting a company, obviously trying to work out how that uh, functions. One of the key things that we realized early on was that open source doesn't sit alone. Um, and particularly alongside uh, open access and open data, um, recognizing that for us as a consultancy or a group of development companies, um, our clients tend to be people who are interested in more than one of these things. So we do have some private sector clients who really are just saying, well, we want, we want services around data and around um, development, and if you're going to put these conditions on that, we're happy enough because it doesn't affect our, our commercials. Um, again, if people want to ask some questions more about that, we'll go on to that um, a little bit later. But uh, what we generally found was we we done some work with the Open Data Institute, Open Data NI, um, public sector in general, and once we um, the ones who tended to be interested and the um, people involved in procurement who were interested in open data, open source fitted in quite nicely for them as well. Um, and actually was something that gave us an edge as opposed to being a business challenge. And, um, and so we end up pairing this more and more. In some ways, actually, um, some of the challenges have been the other way. Um, I, we did um, some of the work that we've done, we struggled to get published in open access. And the main uh, reason was because um, I, as a lead author, was in a commercial organization. So I think there's, there is room for uh, broadening some of that um, thinking in, in open source, open data, and open access um, about the kind of people and what ways they tend to be involved. Uh, it can be quite varied. Uh, one thing I'm just going to do a brief shout out for, because I think this is related to open source and education. Um, Open UK, an organisation involved with that's recently started to try and help raise awareness of open source particularly, um, has been running a kids competition. And I think that's a general, a general thing of importance is raising awareness, um, public sector but also schools, um, so that as we're finding the next generation coming through that they're already saying why isn't this open source, why isn't this why don't I have access to this? Um, <clears throat> so um, that particular one, if you do know of any organizations, I think deadline's been extended, uh, you can get a um, open source gloves, um, for anyone who knows image and heats gloves, um, to do a challenge with and learn about open source. Um, other organizations that we've uh, been benefited by working with, and again, coming back to sustainability, um, so flat skills, my own company, uh, Avada Industries, it's a consortium we um, we work with. And uh, we, again, we've looked at ways that we can use open source to give us a business advantage. And one of the ways is saying, okay, well, what business model will work that wouldn't have otherwise worked? And does that allow us into areas that closed source companies can't quite compete as effectively with or organizations? And uh, one of those has been around uh, product building. So um, our Raging Planet is um, uh, primarily or nearly entirely um, driven from a commercial side by Flax and Field, but some of our other work is very much joint. 
Open source, we found, allows us to put together a commercial um, or academic commercial agreement um, that is fairly generous on the IP terms because everyone can walk away with access to the IP and then look at separate commercialization afterwards. So we can actually get an R&D project done. We've got groundwork done that we know isn't going to cause IP friction down the line. And, I, and that's been something that's been quite a selling point. Uh, one good example of this is a project, oh, I'm come back to that one, project that we did with the Open Data Institute. Um, they were interested in having a platform that a little bit like Origin Planet um, was able to, <coughs> um, was able to run various uh, processors in this case, so things that would check if the DSV is the right tables, see if there's any, uh, use natural language processors to check for personally identifiable information offline, um, and that sort of thing, and be able to check if it's you uh, boundary, uh, so points where it's in a geo fence, and have that very pluggable. And um, they were more interested in having that created than having uh, than actually the commercialization afterwards. So being part of a consortium that um, took open source as a basis meant that we were able to collaborate, build that, and then um, the consortium partners that wanted to commercialize it at the end were able to without fucking anyone else off from the FP. So it made it quite a smooth transition where lots of, lots of uh, uh, closed source companies have their R&D <coughs> Uh, R&D scar stories. So, um, first labs again trying to work in with communities that exist. Uh, so in Belfast we've got Farset Labs, um, hackerspace, but also quite a uh, tech community across um, academia, industry, hobbyists, and um, that's been really important for us accessing people and people who are actually interested in working in open source. And this has been a, a benefit from a resourcing perspective. People tend to be much more interested to talk and engage in something that's open than uh, something that isn't. That we did for 10, um, And another benefit of this open source approach that again helps us with sustainability is we said, well, let's take what we're doing um, for our region planet. There are ways that we can advance that um, so the Lintel project, we were able to do that as a tender, and that um, allowed us to build the Lintel project that did data validation, but also using the machinery from uh, our region planet, which we were able to feed straight back in. Different commercial companies involved, no problem because it's open source. And uh, similarly with um, Data Times, that was uh, came up in our user research during Lintel when we talk, started talking to journalists and we said, why don't you use public sector data more? And they said, because we've no idea what it is. And, um, you know, it, is data, is it facts on a web page? Is it so easy, uh, you know, what, what's even out there? Is it relevant to it? So I don't have any time to find it. And so we um, did a project linking in with the work we've done on Lintel and on our raging planet and being able to develop all three um, with, through shared code bases. Um, with um, Google's Digital News Initiative. Um, and that's been a huge educational project. And it's fascinating people that you start talking to through these as well, and local journalists and some of the challenges they face. And sometimes I'm quite glad I'm in IT. Um, but <clears throat> again, these are things that effectively we've tried to find what the open source lets us do that we couldn't otherwise. Um, so, back to a slightly more technical point. Um, where are user-driven models useful? <clears throat> well, there's a few examples we find, and again, the open source aspect of this helps, because I think it comes back to what we were uh, saying earlier about um, auditability and benchmarking and being able to uh, test things in a way that people can see. If you, for example, want to test something with a user, you're going to want to see all of the code that we are using, for example, as a service provider giving infrastructure. Um, because otherwise, what's, uh, you know, what's the value of, of the benchmarking, especially if it has an impact? Um, and being able to, to do that scalably without having to think, you know, hit commercial restrictions every time you start trying to solve a problem. Um, 
So one example of this is doing researcher driven and model trials. Um, and this is one that we, we could see from um, previous projects as well. Another is localized algorithms and something we've been looking at and saying, well, if we can get this wall down to, you know, 50 lines of uh, Python that needs to run in this particular setting, if we can modularize that, that's something that a user can click and say, I want that thing, and I've just added it, then <clears throat> being able to say, okay, well, let's, let's take transport algorithms. One example we've used a few times is uh, the transport, uh, the algorithms that you're going to have to think about perhaps for um, Shetland are going to be very different to those for London, even if the actual infrastructure is identical. So <clears throat> again, trying to find ways of saying where is an open source infrastructure relevant. Okay. Okay. Minute behind. Um, so I'm going to um, run over ten kind of key features um, that go in five groups that we've seen with um, the uh, come up in the building over the last couple of years and then talking to people. And then what I'm going to do is um, ask people maybe to try and feed some, um, some perspective back on, on those points. And um, I'll uh, put them into a Kanban board here as well so we can kind of see and see what kind of things come out of it. So, first one, naturally, is security. So if you're going to take the work that you're doing and uh, maybe work, maybe test it with someone like as a researcher, say for example, uh, you're putting together a model and you want to test it with, um, you know, whether that's a clinician or a geographer or um, <clears throat> a public sector um, stakeholder, and give them a nice straightforward interface to your detailed Python code. Uh, one of the things you're going to be thinking about is security. Um, and in particular for us building a platform is trying to make sure things are sandboxed in a safe way. Um, another is me, sorry. storage and transit. <clears throat> and how things are um, moved back and forward. And also automation. So when we talk about open source, that actually not just the code that we use to run the website, but all of the infrastructure is available. So someone can see, okay, well, actually, you've used Kubernetes as our uh, main um, orchestration system. You know, how have we put that together? Can you start from a completely blank slate and get this all up and running? Flexibility. So there are systems out there for kind of plugging and playing the components together. We've kind of tried to get that a level forward and say, you can do this in, if you've got some Python, say, for example, if you've got some Ruby, if you uh, have uh, Rust, C++, you don't want to have to try and rephrase that into a block, into building blocks that can be put together. You want to be able to take that code, type that code up, and um, start trialing it. Um, and you don't want to have to intervene every time somebody wants to run a simulation. They need to be able to uh, do it themselves once you've added your model, if there's someone you're working with, for example. Um, this idea of lift and lay is, uh, oops, uh, trying to avoid getting tied to one framework. How do you avoid being tied to, say, AWS or GKE, but not being able to run, you know, for example, what, what if you want to run in a cluster? Um, <clears throat> and reproducibility, I think that's one that's obviously quite a theme, um, is trying to make sure that if it works once, it works multiple times. And actually one of the benefits of this type of approach to running models is that a side effect is you have something that's re reproducible um, through that automation and can be linked. And um, finally, trying to interface in a straightforward way. So for example, if you want to create your own simulations that you're not having to learn new live, you know, all these new libraries, it's fairly succinct and straightforward. So I'll come back to that one second here. I can find, sorry. Uh, 
well actually well maybe do the uh, we'll do the group exercise first yeah that's fine and then I'll uh, show a brief uh, demo of what that looks like. Um, maybe five. How are we doing? Twenty. Okay. Um, so. Okay. When moving your work, and I'm not going to focus exclusively on coding because I think different people have different um, types of work that all are relevant to how we do what we're doing, but also I think more generally to understanding this is a problem and a challenge for people. Um, how do you move your work that you're doing on your computer? How do you share it? Is that Google Docs? Is that something that you need at GitHub? Or is that something that you can, that your primary sharing is through um, sending LaTeX files? And um, when you're collaborating, what challenges do you have or foresee well, that security, how about that flexibility I mentioned, the ability to move things back and forth and be consistent and the same as you have them locally. Reproducibility, um, again, that's obviously a challenge for, for most of us <clears throat> in various ways. And, um, and actually doing it without having to massively change your workflow. Um, where do you find those challenges now? So I'm going to I'm sharing my desktop, aren't I? So I should be able to. It's off the screen. Not sure what this looks like. Okay, uh, this is linked from the Google Doc as well, um, but I'm just going to pop a couple of these in here. If people want to. Want to say anything that that, kind, that any of those five brings to mind for them? So I'm not sure which one this comes under. Maybe um, reproducibility. Um, but I, the issue I always find, and I, f I find really difficult to get right actually, is. Um, is really I'm going to call it documentation but actually it's really around explanation so it's it's how do you provide people with enough information okay. to actually yeah. be able to um, use your work and what's the you know what's the effort that how do you work out how much effort to put into that as in effort to use your work or effort to create the documentation I mean well, yeah, so I guess, so the documentation relates to it in the sense that documentation is there to kind of explain what you've done and how it works. Um, but it's sort of how much, so, so documentation could be relatively lightweight within, so it's like the metadata, right? What should the metadata be? So yeah. documentation could be relatively lightweight within a project where you have some continuity there but if you're kind of exposing something to the outside world and you would like others to be able to pick it up and use it without having to have lengthy conversations with the team you know how, how do you how do you make that decision because obviously the, the the more friendly it is and the more kind of well explained it is to other people the more likely it is to be picked up but where's the how do you make that that decision i guess okay Okay, I think that's give a rough summary there. Yeah, great. Kind of yeah. Succinct and um, easy to pick up. So. That's that's the dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Even better if I could spell on words. Yeah. Okay. Anyone got any thoughts on any of the other areas there? So maybe one question is um, how many people have 
a tool that they would go to on a near daily basis on the cloud for sharing work. They would use GitHub like all the time um, for sharing. Um, but that's it. <laughs> that's about my only go to tool, I think. Depend on what you're sharing. I use GitHub if it's code. But if it's something small, it will be something like GIST or Google document if it's some notes, uh, some draft of a documentation, maybe I will go first in a Google doc, I don't know. It depends on. There's also Dropbox for bigger files. Okay. GitHub, GIST. Okay, and you know, um, for those ones that you're both mentioning there, what what would what are the main uh, limitations that you find in collaboration with those, or do you find limitations? Is it, is it straightforward? Is it smooth? I think beyond the sort of like occasional get merge nightmare. Um, then um, yeah. that, um, <laughs> yeah. Well. um yeah i don't I, I tend to i don't tend to find problems with it cool. so, what, uh, oh sorry sorry well. i was just going to note that actually something that so the big projects i work on i haven't but a couple of my colleagues have spent a long time getting all of our tutorials into Binder. And as someone who actually hasn't seen the frantic paddling under the surface happening, it's become incredibly clean. So the whole model is up on Binder and you can just run it through notebooks. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible. Having not seen the work go in, it's so smooth. Yeah. I think that's the thing as well is that there are, there's, um, some fantastic stuff that, and particularly uh, tools like Binder and obviously GitHub, and um, you know we we use Jupyter Hub quite heavily, um, and it feels like the ecosystem is so much more straightforward for collaboration than it was a few years ago. It's often I think um, intertechnical collaboration, if you know what I mean, but it it's um, being able to have that. Uh, especially at the moment, <laughs> you know, having all those processes in place has been so so important. I am taking notes here as uh, well, and I'm, uh, I'm sure there are the Google Talk. Um, yeah. Phil, so are you notes in the same the same Google Doc, or are you taking notes somewhere else? Because I can't see oh, them in there. No, hold on. I've got a couple here. I, I keep refreshing, but I. Um... Oh, sorry. Um, so, while I'm just getting that in there, there we go. Okay. Um, if people had to pick one of those five, um, I suppose, I guess we've had a, a vote for reproducibility, um, effectively, but what would be people's main interests? What would be their priority? You know, say, say for example, with uh, Binder, being able to actually um, have something that uh, somebody else is able to see exactly what's happening and runs in exactly the same way as you can see, um, you know, in that, I suppose, lift and lay sense. Um, what, uh, does anybody see any of the others as kind of their main interest in sharing? Or is that, is that the main interest? I think one thing that, that sort of I'm that concerns me or, or I find a challenge sometimes is, is I guess it's sort of part of the lift and lay is moving code that I know works on my machine and works in CI, moving that to a production environment or to to somewhere else. And there's always one. package differences or 
version differences and suddenly things break things don't work in the way you expect and they can take a long time to debug yeah that's, um... yeah I, I i would say the same so a lot of the code i deal with the full scale analysis we can't run in house because we don't have the resources um but we prototype the, the code in house where we have kind of full control over the software environment but then have to shift it to a, a high performance cluster where we don't have um the same kind of admin access and so you often get into really really tricky dependency issues where things suddenly don't compile anymore um and then it's endless back and forth with their help desk to sort out uh dependencies and is that is there any particular tools that you uh use for that um things like singularity or um or docker uh based um containerization solutions or or is it mostly <clears throat> lift and recompile it's yeah it's very ad hoc at the moment the way the so it's a uh, research council run um, uh, system uh, and so it's it's very ad hoc and more like man manual inter um, uh, yeah manual fixes for it and it might get better they're switching to a kind of conda environment type system so that might make it easier in the future but we'll, we'll have to see okay um Okay, well that's useful. And one uh, last question before I uh, move on to a couple of summary notes here, because I realise we're, we're coming up to time. Um, do people find um, that there are friction when they're working with non-technical users um, with some of their technical work, or is that something people are having to do? You have to just deal with it as part of the workflow right <laughs> yeah yeah and it kind of gets better with practice i feel like the more you interact with your users the more you get in their heads and you start yeah. to be able to see the the typical workflows of problems <laughs> yeah and that i think that's a big part of what we have to learn ourselves is um you know especially working with it it's it might sound slightly strange but one of the, the big benefits of working with uh you know schools is that um, it forces you to think things through in a very different way. Um, so. We find the same thing with undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. we use our, our software as a sort of as, as a sort of educational tool as well as a research tool. So what we learned from watching the undergrads epically screw up installing and running it we can then implement into our making sure our developer users actually get a good experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, very briefly, I'll... Um, I think we have just one minute left till the end of the session. Okay, that's grand. Um, I can't see. Uh, so... Um, so I think uh, I really might just leave it there then I think that's probably uh, if I can pull that oh, no, there we go. see if I can bring that up bring it here yes we do no we don't no never mind um so I think just I want to say thank you because that's actually been quite useful feedback. Um, we are going to do more work uh, in the academic area, um, particularly with our backgrounds. And um, I think one of the things we are particularly interested in are any groups that do want to see uh, ways of moving some of their um, particular code, um, open data work uh, into the uh, into non-technical platforms um, for working with users, say, or um, and uh, please do get in touch 
if um, if you are uh, interested in um, talking to us, uh, mention those um, and my uh, contact details. Hopefully, you can see there. Um, as I mentioned, that slide deck is available. So if there's anything else, I've also put an extra few slides in there, which I knew we wouldn't really get through today, but with a little bit more video information, uh, video examples and explanation of some of the technical background. I think that's basically us at time. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. And thank you particularly for uh, those who were uh, hosting. And um, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank I think, you. Uh,